Welcome everyone. This is uh, the introduction for our several in advance uh, open, sorry, I wasn't prepared to make an introduction. I apologize. My name is Dawn Weatherford. I'm here to introduce the One World Cognitive Psychology Conference, where today we will be welcoming uh, Danny Oppenheimer. Uh, Danny comes to us from Carnegie Mellon in, uh, University. Uh, he got his undergraduate at Rice, uh, his MA and his PhD at Stanford. He started his career at Princeton, transferred to UCLA, and now he's here speaking with us today. Uh, some fun facts about him. He actually won an Ig Nobel Award for things that make you laugh first and think next uh, for a very interesting, uh, a very interestingly named uh, article, which we'll put in the chat for you. Uh, but essentially, he's got an, a fun personality that I hope translates into our conversation today. Uh, Danny, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. Intro to Psych, good. All right. So today he's gonna to be speaking to us about psychology in the age of augmented cognition. I wanna make everyone in the audience aware that we do have a question and answer section wherein you can type your chats as they come to your mind along the way. Uh, Danny's gonna save the conversation that we have wherein we answer those questions uh, to the very end of our conversation. But in the meantime, if you want to correspond with us there, put in information that you would like us to understand or know there, uh, that's the place uh, where that can begin. Otherwise, I direct everyone's attention to Danny. Thank you so much. Take it away. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, the uh, the Ig Nobel Prize, for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a science humor award. Um, and uh, it's, of course, uh, not the same as a Nobel Prize, which is a science quality award. Um, but it is by far the most prestigious thing I have ever won. And so it's prominently displayed on my CV right at the top. Um, and uh, I was giving a talk at a, a university and they sent out, uh, I sent them my CV for publicity purposes. And they decided that uh, the Ig part of the Ig Nobel must be a typo. Um, because, you know, that's the sort of typo a Nobel Prize winner might make on their uh, their CV. Um, and so I, uh, I decided, uh, so I got to the campus and there were, um, all over campus were plastered these signs welcoming Nobel Prize winner Danny Oppenheimer, um, which, of course, I have not won a Nobel Prize. So uh, it was a very awkward situation when I arrived in completely full packed crowd waiting to see a Nobel Prize winner. And I had to say, no, uh, I'm, I'm not actually capable of, of that kind of quality, perhaps, but I uh, some people think I'm funny. Um, and I, I don't know, we'll see uh, if you agree with that assessment. Anyway, uh, I'm really, really honored to be here. I'm so excited to be talking to all of you and be a part of this uh, wonderful enterprise that Psychonomics is putting on. Um, and I wanna talk to you today about some research I'm doing and thinking about uh, on the topic of psychology in the age of augmented cognition. Um, so I wanna open with a question. Uh, it's a, a pretty straightforward question, which is, um, where does um, thinking happen? Um, and traditional models of thinking basically have considered thinking to occur in the brain, um, which makes sense because thinking primarily occurs in the brain. However, it's worth noting that the brain and the individual that the brain is part of are embedded in a context which includes our social networks, our tools, and our environments. And we often outsource elements of thinking and our cognition from our brains to what can be thought of as the extended organism. Uh, we outsource all sorts of cognition. We outsource timekeeping to clocks. We outsource navigation to maps. We outsource mathematics to calculators. Uh, for basically any cognitive task that a human might engage in, there are ways of outsourcing at least part of it to an external device. Um, so, you know, this, this is something we are all aware of. Now, um, this isn't new. Um, ancient civilizations had tools to help us think also. Uh, the abacus was used in Mesopotamia over 2,500 years ago. Um, in in uh, the Incan empires, there was uh, an elaborate system of knots known as kipu, which were common for record keeping to keep uh, so we didn't have to remember everything. Uh, and people have used pen and paper to solve equations and set reminders for centuries. Um, what's different is uh, the pace at which technology is advancing and the nature of what that technology can do. Right? So cuneiform tablets of the old days can do a lot less than the touchscreen tablets of today. Uh, the pace of innovation and cognitive augmentation has been exponential. 
Uh, in our lifetimes, for the first time in human history, we have access to the sum knowledge of humanity 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, right before COVID hit, I went on a week-long horseback trip across the plains of the Mongolian steppes. Um, and it was some of the most remote territory in the world. We would cover vast distances where there were no humans. Um, and we would go hours on horseback without seeing another person. And I had cell, cell phone service the entire time where I could access Google and basically Wikipedia and anything else that anyone needs to know. And now, of course, since then, we've got generative AI. So we have even more uh, opportunities to outsource cognitive tasks. Um, so as, as a decision scientist, I try to understand cognitive and social processes that underlie judgment and decision making. But those processes are changing because not all of the thinking that goes on in the decision making process is being done by the person making the decision. So in order to understand the decision process, we have to understand the extended organism, um, how the tools we use are influencing the decisions we make. So many psychologists already look at the extended organism and think about questions like when we outsource decisions to other people and uh, when we do or don't outsource our thinking to algorithms. And um, I expect that in the next decade, as generative AI becomes more prominent and more sophisticated, there's going to be an emergent cognitive psychology of artificial intelligence. Uh, since much of our thinking will be done by AI, understanding that thinking and understanding the thinking that underlies our behavior will uh, require understanding of the cognitive mechanisms of how AI thinks. Um, but aside from just understanding that, I I'm also interested in how outsourcing the basic building blocks of cognition to technology can fundamentally change the nature, uh, qualitative nature and outcomes of the parts of thinkings that humans do for themselves. Um, there's not that much work on that in the literature right now. And the goal of this talk is to convince you that this is a major oversight for the field and it needs to be rectified. So let me give you a sense of what I mean and, and illustrate it a little more closely. A typical model might look something like this. Uh, and I recognize this is highly schematized. I'm well aware that memory is recruited in a much more complex way than I am currently displaying it. But let's just go with a simple schema. Um, so we recruit information from our long-term store and we put it into short-term memory and we engage in um, some sort of cognitive operations on that information, which leads us to make a decision. So the question arises, what happens if instead of recruiting that information from internal storage, we recruit that information from an external source instead? I'm using Google here, but it could be any memory offloading device or even other people. Well, you may ask, what does it matter? where I get the information that I'm using, but there are a couple reasons we might be concerned about it. The first is that different information might be recruited. The way our, our internal semantic networks are organized is almost certainly different from how Google is organized. Um, and that's not just the obvious point of different information points to different decisions. So if I ask you to judge the quality of, I'm, in, I'm at Carnegie Mellon right now, if I ask you to judge the quality of Pittsburgh sports, you may come up with a different answer if you're thinking of the Steelers who are perennially one of the best football teams uh, in the country than if you're thinking of the Pirates, which are perennially one of the worst baseball teams in the country. Um, so what information we bring to mind, uh, you know, obviously can change the uh, decisions we make. Uh, but also it's worth noting this is more nuanced than that because the order in which information comes to mind has been implicated in a wide range of decision systems, uh, such as framing effects and interpersonal uh, intertemporal choices. Um, query theory suggests that the, it's not just about what we think of, but the order in which we think of and the manner in which we think of it that can implicate these, these fu fundamental phenomena. Uh, if different information comes to mind, we might make different decisions. Um, and I'm not saying that the decisions will be better or worse, but they'll be different. Um, so using Google could reduce bias search for information, but it could also prevent one from considering idiosyncratically relevant information. So this isn't about good or bad, it's just different. And if we want to understand the system, we have to understand those differences. The second thing worth noting is that retrieval itself um, the process of retrieval changes the accessibility and organization of information. So the brain adapts when we retrieve information to, uh, and makes the information we've retrieved more accessible and competing information less accessible. So what I'm talking about here are things like the testing effect, where when you bring information to mind, it makes it easier to recall later, uh, or retrieval-induced forgetting, which is when you bring information to mind, it makes competing information less accessible. Um, and this is really a useful thing. It, it allows us to find the information we need uh, and use regularly more easily when we need it. Uh, I'm much more likely to need to, un to remember Pittsburgh restaurants um, where I live than Los Angeles restaurants where I lived when I was at UCLA because I live in Pittsburgh. So uh, any memory system should be adaptive to make it easier to find things in my immediate environment. Um, so all of the, the the way that the plasticity of the mind works, it, this is really well uh, evolved. But when we outsource retrieval, this doesn't happen, which might have long-term consequences. 
I have some work on this that I'm not going to be talking about today, um, but using the information, uh, sorry, the internet to search for information uh, today, as opposed to searching our internal store, can influence what we'll be able to retrieve tomorrow. Um, and it's also worth noting that uh, Betsy Sparrow and, and all have found that knowing that the offloaded information is available uh, off outside of our memory changes what we decide to encode. Um, Mary Hargis is also another one doing a lot of work on this. So we tend to encode where to find the information rather than what the information is if we know that we can later look it up. Uh, and finally, uh, well, not finally, but a third thing I should say is that metacognition is different um, and metacognitive cues inform judgment. So we don't have access to the same metacognitive information uh, when Google is doing our thinking for us than when we are doing our thinking for ourselves. Now, I'm going to start and focus on number three because that's where my own research is largely focused, but I'm going to come back to some of the other points later to elaborate when we get to the discussion. So metacognition is important because the experiences of how we know what we know, what, you know, what, how we know what we know, what we think that we know, how we think that we think, these things uh, have downstream consequences. Um, it helps us know how much to study. If I think I understand this material, I don't have to study it anymore. If I think I don't understand it, I may have to spend more time on it. It helps us know when to seek help. So if I try that plumbing uh, project myself, when I really don't know what I'm doing, I flood my house. Um, if I could do it and I instead hire a plumber, I'm out $100 that I shouldn't have been out. Um, and it also influences all sorts of other judgments as it is a cue towards judgment of self. So fluency, which is this experience of ease or difficulty associated with a cognitive process, um, has been implicated in all sorts of, uh, of judgments. Things that are easier to process we think are more true, we value them more, we think they're worth more money, we like them more, we think they're more intelligence, we have more confidence in them, and on and on and on. Um, so this, um, this notion that uh, the subjective experience influences our judgments um, is, is really important because when we outsource things, we may not have access to those same metacognitive cues. Um, so when I think about metacognition, what we know about what we know, how we think about what we think, uh, I'm going to use the Coriat 97 model here. I know there are other models that are competing, and um, we could get into debates about what's the right model to use. But for time constraints and simplicity, I'm just using this Coriat model. And because for the sorts of arguments I'm making today, it doesn't really matter what model I use. Um, so Coriat breaks down metacognition into three things. You're trying to know, will you be able to learn something? And there are intrinsic cues. These are things that are characteristics of the studied items. So for example, the length of the word. Longer words are harder to remember. We have a sense of that. So if I ask you to remember longer words, you may say you, you may predict that you'll have more difficulty learning them. We know that some tasks are harder than others for humans, but the tasks that are harder for the human mind aren't necessarily the hardest for a digital mind or an extended mind. And so right there, our intrinsic cues may be different. Um, we also have extrinsic cues. These are things about the conditions of learning. So for example, in a noisy room where there are distractions, it may be harder to learn material than when a quiet room where it's just us. Um, we know some environments are more or less conducive to tasks, but um, what are our assumptions about how effective uh, we will be in various tasks in digital environments? And are those assumptions accurate? And uh, we just don't know. So those are also um, going to potentially be influenced by offloading. But the third thing is internal mnemonic cues. And these are the subjective experience, the fluency experiences I just mentioned, of how well an item has been learned. And this third category is largely missing entirely when we're dealing with offloading. So... Uh, if I'm using a calculator, calculating the square root of 73 is just as easy as calculating 10 plus 10, uh, perhaps easier because I have to press, press fewer buttons to calculate it. Um, using GPS, I don't feel the struggle of figuring out a route um, or the uncertainty of whether I've gotten lost. Um, when I drive without GPS, I sometimes think to myself, well, have I passed the street? It's, it feels like I've gone a mile. I don't know if I've gone a mile. Maybe I've gone too far. How long should I go before I turn around? With GPS, it just tells me. And so a lot of these metacognitive cues of uncertainty are just missing. And this means two things. First, our judgments are being subtly impacted because the fluency experiences and other metacognitive experiences are being impacted. And secondly, uh, we're not necessarily metacognitively aware of how using tech is changing the way we think. The process is so fluent with modern tech, we may not even notice that these changes are happening. So to get at this a little more clearly, I want to uh, raise the topic of what's called the division of cognitive labor. Um, I, I have a great Pickles comic here that I think uh, gives the intuition. We all have work to do, Nelson. It's called division of labor. Your job is to pick up the toys. And what's your job, Grandma? My job, I do most of the cooking and cleaning. And what's Grandpa's? Grandpa's job is pretending to know stuff. Eh? Um, it really feels <laughs> like the way the world works sometimes, right? So take the example of understanding how much of your own thinking you're doing for yourself versus how much your tech is doing for you. 
Are we aware of how much cognitive work we delegate to our tools? And I want to talk about the division of cognitive labor for this project. This is with my uh, former postdoc, Matt Fisher. Um, and the way we can divide this uh, cognitive labor is he did all of the thinking and uh, intellectual um, activity for this. And I basically told bad metacognition jokes. Um, so I also want to say that Matt has a lot of other excellent research in this general vein. And the things that I talk about today that he wasn't directly involved in were inspired often by conversations with him over his time working with me. So thank you to Matt. Um, so here's, here's some studies to test at this thing. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in some, well, we're going to uh, recruit some MTurk participants, and we're going to ask them simple trivia questions, in this case, uh, world capital trivia questions, and they will either get to work with a robot teammate, or actually two robot teammates, or on their own. Um, so what we do is we get five easy questions, five medium questions, and five hard questions. And you may wonder, how do we know if the questions are easy, medium, or hard? And the way we do it is by going to a website called Sporkle. Uh, for those of you who know about Sporkle, you know it's a great trivia website, and you're probably already addicted to it. And for those of you who don't know Sporkle, I've probably just lost you hours of your life as you now search it out and end up spending your time doing trivia quizzes rather than doing work that would be actually be productive. But regardless, um, Sporkle quizzes have been done by millions of people, and they are a great source of information if you want to know how easy or difficult a question is relative to other questions. The people who use Sporkle are all trivia fans, and so they tend to have higher accuracy rates than the population at large. But the questions that they get right um, versus get wrong can tell you relatively how easy or difficult the questions are. So here what I have is a bunch of countries that we use in our study. Uh, I have currently blocked off the capital because if you are anything like I am, you want to be testing yourself before you get to that because it's sort of fun to do so. And the key thing to think in this third column is that some questions are pretty straightforward and people get them. Some of them are harder and some of them are very, very difficult. Um, so here are some of the questions. I will now reveal to you the capitals. Um, and as you look at those, you can check whether or not you knew what the answers were. Um, and I know what you're all thinking right now. You're thinking, huh, the capital of Burundi has been changed from Bujumbura to Katega. Um, and so he's totally off on this. But actually, at the time of the study, Bujumbura was the capital there. So uh, I didn't want to be misleading. OK, um, so we had robot teammates. Think GPT versus Gemini. These are actually, the robot teammates are much less sophisticated than this. But it's uh, allowing people to offload their uh, reasoning to uh, a bot. Um, and the robot teammates come in three versions. Um, they either always answer the easiest remaining question, they always answer the hardest remaining question, or they answer a random remaining question. And the way that the study is designed is that the human chooses one of the uh, questions and answers it and is told whether they're right or not. Then a robot one takes over and answers one of the questions. Then robot two takes over and answers one of the questions. And then it goes back to the human who tries again. And they do this until all 15 questions have been answered. And we have a dependent measure, which is participants at the end predict how well they would have done on a future capital quiz of similar difficulty if they had to do it on their own, if they hadn't had their robot teammates helping. And the basic finding here is that people um, are uh, in the alone condition, which is represented in blue, um, tend to think that they aren't going to do as well as people who have had robots helping them. Um, that is, when I have a robot helping me, and then you ask me, how well will I do in the future um, if I don't have the robot helping me? I think, I'm going to do really well. Whereas when I don't have a robot helping me, I think, I, this was very hard. I may not do so well. Having the robot help us, helps. Uh, you know, it does help us, but we're not aware of how much it helps us. And we tend to overestimate our future performance. Now, you may say, well, maybe merely seeing the questions being answered is what leads to these uh, metacognitive beliefs. It's like the robots are getting these right. Therefore, they are possible to get right. Therefore, it must be easy to answer them. And so it has nothing to do with whether I'm getting help, but just seeing the that it is possible to answer these questions. Um, so that's a, a rather uninspiring an a possible mechanism here. Um, so is it just observing that people are getting the answers right? So we can do the study again, but in one condition, participants play the game with their two robot teammates. And in another condition, they just observe three robots playing the game. And at the end, they're asked, how well would you do if you had to play the game without robots? Um, and so it's also, if anything, a conservative estimate, because in the passive condition, all 15 answers are going to be correct. Um, well, in the active condition, they could theoretically miss one and see lower team performance. But actually, what you see is the opposite of the prediction that would be the case if it, with that conservative estimate, which is that people who are actively participating think they're doing really well. Uh, and they are. They've got robots helping them. And when they're asked how well they would do without the robot help, they think they would still do very well. Um, whereas people who just watch it are aware that they're not going to do as well. Um, and so they they um, they do, they estimate that they would do 
poorer in the future than people who have been actively participating. So it actually requires active participation um, to mess up your metacognition. Uh, now you may be saying, wait a minute, you keep talking about overcalibration, uh, you know, overconfidence and miscalibration. Maybe the people who are working with the robots are actually better calibrated. Maybe the people who are working uh, on their own are underestimating their future performance. Uh, and how well does this generalize to other domains? It, it, does working with a robot skew my metacognition everywhere, or is it just where I am using the uh, robot help? Uh, so we ran another study, and we asked them to do the same task as before. Um, but in addition to asking them how well they would do on a future capitals quiz, we also asked them, asked them how well they would do on a company logo quiz to see if it, um, so they're shown pictures of company logos and asked to identify what company that logo is associated with. Um, they also take a second capitals quiz and a no novel company logo quiz to determine how accurate their calibration was. And here's what we find. Um, and it's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, when they are in the alone condition, they are Still overconfident, people tend to be overconfident generally, but it's a very small amount of overconfidence. Um, when they are in the team condition and they are asked to estimate how well they will do on the capitals, which they have already done with the machine help, um, now they're massively overestimating how well they'll do. That does not generalize to how well they'll do on different types of information and different quizzes. But when they are engaging in a capitals quiz originally, they um, do well. The robots are answering a lot of the questions, which helps them do well. And then they attribute the success to themselves rather than to the uh, help that they're getting. So they aren't aware of how much the tech is changing their performance. Now, I've made an, a mechanistic claim here that what's going on here is outsourcing cognition reduces our access to our internal mnemonic cues, easy for me to say, um, and leads to worse metacognitive judgment. Um, so interventions that force people to query their internal memories and actually gives access to that mnemonic cue would then improve accuracy, which is both an intervention and a way of testing mechanism. Um, so when people query their own memories, that's, um, those internal mnemonic cues aren't hundred percent accurate, but they're still better than the nothing they get when someone else is answering. So, um, we can do this in two ways. We can force them to query their internal, uh, mnemonic cues by either introducing a delay so that they have to sit there and wait for the answer and which gives them a chance to see for themselves if they know the answers. This is sort of what I did to you with the Sporkle quizzes, um, where I, I blocked off the answers before you didn't see them immediately. Another thing I can do is I cannot give them the answers by default. And in order to get assistance, they have to query. They have to press a button. So they have to start by trying to do it themselves. And when they can't do it, at that point, they realize they can't do it and they ask for help. Um, so this requires active choice to get assistance, uh, which will help calibrate them because they theoretically will know they don't know the answers. So here are um, some, some pieces of evidence that that is indeed accurate. Uh, in this case, we asked them uh, various trivia questions of intermediate difficulty, again, normed on, on Sporkle. Um, what is the Roman equivalent of the Greek deity Zeus, for example? Now, for some people, they get no hint at all. Uh, for some people, they get a hint, the first letter. In this case, that would be a J. And for other people, uh, they don't get a hint at all um, until seven seconds has passed. And they're supposed to estimate how well they would do on a similarly difficult trivia question if they didn't have any hints. And what we see here is that without a hint, once again, we, uh, we're seeing that people without a hint, um, and this is different from getting a robot answering it, but it's still uh, getting help from a technology. Um, so without a hint, they think in the future they're not going to do as well as if they do have a hint. They think that, that they will be so when they get a hint, they uh, attribute their success. The hint helps them, but they attribute them su their success to themselves and think that in the future, even without the hint, they would not struggle. When you give them a delay, they get better calibrated. Not perfect, but better calibrated. As though they realize in the seven seconds they're having to wait, wait, this, this hint is actually necessary. Um, we also wanted to introduce a help button equivalent. So we do that. And so here they answered eight trivia questions of intermediate difficulty. Uh, again, same questions. But in this case, instead of waiting for delay, in order to get help, they have to press a button asking for help. And I promise you, this graph is different from the last one. Um, this is a different graph. It looks very similar. The trends are qualitatively the same. Uh, again, pushing a button, being forced to push a button to ask for help makes people better calibrated. They know they had to push the button, so they know that they didn't uh, do it on their own, but they are still not as well calibrated as if they'd never gotten a hint at all. Okay, uh, that was using uh, trivia questions, so it's about a memory task, but we can also do problem solving tasks. So here we have them do anagrams. So they get eight le letters, like the ones displayed on the screen here, um, and they have to solve as many anagrams as they can. In uh, the no hint condition, they just have to do that without any hints. With the hint condition, we give them the first three letters. In this case, that would be E-L-E, 
and we ask them to try to solve as many as possible. Um, and in, uh, Or we give them uh, the hint, but the hints don't arrive until a seven second delay. And we ask them, how well would you do on another anagram task if you didn't have the hints? And again, I promise you this is a different graph. Uh, but the trends are qualitatively the same. In the no hint condition, people are aware that this is a very difficult task. In the hint condition, they think they will do better. And in the delay condition, they it does help them calibrate when they are getting a sense that I'm really not doing very well without these hints. I need them to appear. But um, they still don't get back to uh, the level they would be if they hadn't used hints at all. And we can do this again with the help button. This is the same as the last study, except in this case, we give them a help button instead of a delay. Um, and here, we actually... Uh, finally get the situation where people with the button are as calibrated as those who never got a hint in the first place. So a button works uh, better than a delay in this case, although it didn't for memory. Now you may be again saying, wait a minute, is this overconfidence or are they actually getting better calibrated? Maybe people are better than they think they are uh, and the tech helps them do that. Uh, you also may wonder, is it really the mechanism that I have been arguing uh, about lack of access to internal mnemonic cues that explains the results? Um, so what we're going to do here is uh, two things. The first of which is um, we're going to uh, ask them explicitly about their fluency experience. How difficult did they find the previous set of words to solve? And the second thing is we're going to, at the end, ask them to actually solve a second set of anagrams uh, that were pretested to be as difficult as the first set. Um, and so we're going to go with the pushing the help button here uh, design. And so we will be able to test, are they more accurate or less accurate um, having received hints and if they use a help button. So here's what the results are. So regardless, um, so this, this actual is... Um, is describing how they do when they don't have help. So remember, they do a task with no help, help, or a button. And then they have to do the to predict how well they'll do a second time. And then we look at how well they do the second time. And the second time, they don't have help. And so you can see that having help or a button at time one does not meaningfully influence how effective they are at time two with solving the task. So it's not as though people who get help the first time do better the second time or anything like that. Everybody is at about 33% regardless. Um, and we replicate this predicted condition. So the people in the no help prediction are actually quite accurate. They're spot on to how well they're going to do the second time around. But the people who have received help at time one, um, knowing that they're not going to get help at time two, drastically overestimate how well they're going to do at time two. And the people in the button condition, as we saw in the previous study, are basically perfectly calibrated again. Um, we also asked them their difficulty levels, and you can see here that people in the no help condition really thought this was hard, people in the help condition thought it was considerably easier, and the people in the button condition are somewhere in between. But we did a mediation analysis, and the effect is fully mediated by judgments of difficulty, which suggests that, again, this fluency effect is really a powerful um, uh, driver of this. Um, okay, so... We know that uh, introducing delays or removing defaults help people with metacognitive calibration engendered by augmenting technologies, but this is really only the tip of the iceberg for how big this general question is. Um, and to get at that, I, I want to sort of create a framework that is about the way I've always thought about cognition. I thought of cognition and cognitive psychology as really trying to answer two questions. The first is what information do we represent? What do we pay attention to? What are we bringing to mind? And the second is what we do with that uh, information. What operations do we perform on those representations? And I feel like if we could understand how and what we represent and understand what, what we do with those representations, we've basically got cognition largely solved. Um, so those are the two things I try to solve. So let's break down how technology influences these two major questions. So what information do we represent? Well, we already talked about number one, different information might be recruited because when you search Google, for example, you're going to get different information than if you search your mind. Uh, and we've also talked about uh, number two, that retrieval changes with the accessibility and organization of information, which will change future information recruitment. But I want to talk about two more things here. One is about changing the focus of attention. So attention to different cues can drive decision making. Um, and so the tech that pushes us to attend to different things may lead us to have different sorts of decisions. Um, a great example of this is Lara Borditsky, uh, her work on arbitrary grammar distinctions across languages that lend us to uh, lead us to attend to different things. So, for example, uh, past tense in Indonesian. In Indonesian, they have different past tenses than we do in English. Uh, and as a result of that, 
people attend to different elements of past versus or to when things are happening than we do in English, and that affects their memory for what pictures they have seen. Um, she's also got work on grammatical gender and how that leads us to attend to different things in, um, in language, which changes our memories of those things and our perceptions of those things. So if a, a tool requires people to attend to certain information in order to use it, uh, then people will attend to that information more, which will change um, what they come to the conclusion of. So if I have to, when I'm doing prompt engineering for GPT, it changes the sorts of queries that I'm making internally and externally. It changes the sorts of questions that I ask about what I should be focusing on um, because GPT requires different prompt engineering than when I'm recruiting memories from internally. Um, a second thing is about it changes how we interact with other people and what social cues we might pick up on. And I think a great example of this is um, birthdays. So birthdays are usually a pretty good cue towards whether or not a friend is a good friend or not so good a friend. Uh, if somebody remembers your birthday, that means they're devoting bandwidth and caring about you. And that means they're probably a pretty good friend. Um, but now I get daily reminders from Facebook um, about whose, whose birthdays are today, and I can send a, uh, them an email. And so um, that doesn't whether or not I send you an email about your birthday doesn't really tell you as much about whether or not we're close. Or another example of this is how much you know about a person's daily life. Uh, a person who I know a lot of, my wife, I know everything that's going on in her life because she tells me it every night. Um, and so the people I'm closest to, I get updates on and I know more about what's going on. Uh, except now the algorithms determine which of my friends I'm learning about and what I'm learning about them. And so, um, you know, it's no longer about the people that I'm close to because they tell me more and I trust them more. Um, but but uh, it's now about these social media algorithms to helping determine um, who I am close to and what I talk to them about. And that skews our cues. So this is about what information we rep represent, both in social domains and in more purely cognitive domains. The second thing here is the operations we perform on these representations. Um, so... Different technology has different cognitive affordances, and affordances are the things that the technology allows you to do easily versus not. Um, for example, it's easier to edit what you've written on a computer than on a pen and paper. Um, I guess with a pen and paper, if you have an eraser, um, if you have a pencil and paper, then uh, you can erase things, but it's still a hassle to do so, and then you have to rewrite it from scratch. Whereas if I'm writing an uh, essay on, on a computer, I can cut and paste things, I can delete things easily, uh, I can move things around, I can undo things that I didn't like. Um, and so it's a lot easier to edit on a computer than with pen and paper. Um, which may mean that when I'm using a pen and paper, I have to think through what I want to say because it's harder to change things. So I have to know approximately what I want to say in an approximately what order before I start. And as a result of that, it can change the way I make arguments and the nuance and sophistication of the arguments. With uh, writing on a computer, I'm just writing as I think and then changing it. Whereas with a pen and paper, I've thought it through in advance, which can make it more nuanced potentially. Um, I don't want to say it's better, but it's certainly different. Um, it also uses, it can change the word choices we use. Um, because we can type faster than we can handwrite, uh, we can, we have less time, when, when I finish word one, I have less time before I get to word two, which means I have less time to search my mental lexicon to figure out what word I want to say for word two. Uh, whereas when I'm handwriting, I'm slow enough to write that I have more time to search my mental lexicon. And the result of that is that studies have shown that people um, use a greater diversity of words. They use words with more nuance rather than using the same words over and over because they have more time to search their uh, their vocabulary before they write them. So you get end up with different writing uh, depending on the cognitive affordances of a tech. Um, another thing is that tech can free up or use up limited cognitive resources. You know, we only have seven plus or minus two pieces of information in our working memory at a time. And for more complex thought, we're going to have to use some sort of heuristic or shortcut. If tech frees up space by doing computations for us, it changes what processing strategies we're capable of and willing to use. We may now have free bandwidth to do more complex system two type processing. Alternatively, uh, tech can serve as a distraction. It, it allows us to multitask. Um, it can require task switching. It can impose cognitive demands on us. And it can force us to use more heuristic strategies because we have less bandwidth. It depends on the nature of which tech we're using. Um, and of course, there's also worth noting that there's a possibility of cognitive atrophy, which is if we outsource frequently to tech, we may lose the ability to efficiently engage in a particular cognitive skill or task because we're not using it enough. All right, so that's all about uh, outsourcing cognition. I also want to say this is true of group decision making as well for those of us who are interested in sort of macro level or group processes and group cognition. Um, 
I, uh, I want to take, for example, wisdom of crowds, um, which relies on people having independent estimates. So wisdom of crowds, when multiple people make estimates and you average them, that tends to be more accurate than individuals making estimates. And and, um, and that works, but it requires those um, estimates to be independent because if they are all the same estimate, you you aren't getting rid of noise. Um, basically, the way Wisdom of Crowd works, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is that every individual in the group has some signal and some noise, just like with all experimental research. Um, if you uh, average across multiple observations, the noise cancels, but the signal does not. And what that leads to is group uh, estimates being better than individual estimates. Um, but if we have correlated estimates, then that's not going to work anymore because now our, our noise is also correlated rather than being random and doesn't cancel. Um, so if everybody is searching Google, then everybody is outsourcing to the same source. Everybody has the same information and their estimates become correlated and wisdom of crowd becomes less effective. And wisdom of crowd has been implicated in a lot of societal effectiveness uh, elements. So one of the reasons that people who are unknowledgeable can still help democratic institutions is because the noise cancels, but what little knowledge, what little knowledge they have can, can lead through. Um, but if everybody's using the same sources of information, that can go away. Um, but there's other things here in group decisions. So when you're on um, Zoom, uh, the timing of who speaks and when they speak changes than when you're talking in person. Uh, different information becomes available in different orders, uh, and it inter changes our interpretation of later information. It's also easy for social norms to emerge that influence the decision outcomes that may not have occurred in face-to-face -face conversations for good or ill. But I want to talk about another study coming out of my lab that I think is really interesting and explains how use of tech can have unintended consequences um, and change our cognitions in interesting ways. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk to you about is, um, this is a study, uh, a basic creativity study. We're using a paradigm that's well-established where we just ask people to generate as many uses as they can uh, for various objects. And the particular example I'm showing you, it's how many uses can you come up with an umbrella? Now, half of our participants have access to Google when they answer this, and half do not have access to any tech support. They have to come up entirely from internal sources with these uses. So it's purely a creative enterprise. Um, when people don't have access to Google, they come up with a certain number of uses, but not as many as the people who use Google. The people who uh, are using Google tend to come up with more uses. Um, because Google helps them do that, um, which is why you use supportive tech and augmenting tech. Um, so as an individual, Google gives you an advantage in creativity. But then we did this simulation where what we do is we take the answers given by K participants um, from within a condition and combine them. So for example, for K equals two, we take the uh, total number of unique answers of two randomly selected participants. Um, so if they both gave the same answers, that doesn't count as a unique answer. It's whenever they give a new answer that the other participant did not, and we sum them. Um, and we count the total number of combined unique uses that the two participants generated. We those throw those participants back in the pool, sample again, and repeat this 10,000 times. And what we end up with is an average number of uses that a pair of people collectively will come up with, even though they're not working together, how many they come up with independently when they either use Google or they don't. We repeat this again for groups of k equals 3 all the way up to k equals 20. Uh, so again, these groups are not working together to generate uses, but we're looking at the number of unique uses that people generated collectively when they did or did not have access to uh, the internet. Um, and what we find is that while individually people do better with Google, at a certain K, the collective without Google starts beating the collective with Google. And that's because the people using Google come up with more answers, but they're all the same answers. Everybody's coming up with the same answers. While folks who are not using Google come up with some of the same answers, you know, everybody for umbrella comes up with keeping dry, but they come up with less unusual answers. Um, so they may not remember, you know, so some people will come up with using as a doorstop, others will come up with using as a weapon, others will uh, come up with uh, trying to use it as an exercise device where you run uh, and create air resistance. And uh, some people will say you can feed it to a goat. You get a wider range of types of answers when people are generating them independent of Google. And at this particular point, K equals six, it isn't always, but in this example it is. Um, it, that you see a switch where suddenly people who are not using Google um, are generating more, the collective of people not using Google are coming up with more unique answers. Um, and I think that this is important because say we have a big problem in society, something like climate change or inequality or disease. We need a lot of creative ideas to how, uh, on how to solve them. You know, if common standard solutions work, it doesn't matter if you have Google or not, people will come up with them. But for the more difficult problems that need out of the box solutions, 
um, to the extent that people are using Google, uh, the collective is less likely to stumble across that solution. And we're all using Google. Um, and society has some big challenges that need creative solutions. So this is an interesting question that um, I think it wor is worth further uh, investigation. And it's interesting to see how things uh, this sort of trend will change in the wake of GPT. My guess is that Ks will probably be much larger, but that the trend may be the same. All right. Uh, sort of final thought. I have a daughter, a two-year-old daughter. Um, she just turned two. And I'm starting to become curious about the availability of outsourcing tech to and what that does to child development. Um, does a lack of practice in certain cognitive sc skills because they're being outsourced lead those skills to never develop in the first place and leave uh, children in trouble when they don't have access to their uh, skills? Um, or maybe if those skills are precursors to other skills, the other skills may develop difficulty. So you can imagine a skill that young children aren't capable of yet, um, but they serve as bottlenecks to further cognitive development, such that if the simple skills are outsourced, Skills can sort of uh, children can skip developmental milestones and gain advanced cognitive skills earlier than we previously thought, uh, and then have to go back and learn those basic uh, precursors later. Um, this is my daughter. These pictures of her uh, reading a book and um, trying to solve a crossword puzzle. Although both reading and solving crossword puzzles are perhaps uh, overestimates of the amount of success she has at these tasks. Um, okay. So where does this leave us? Where does all this conversation leave us? Um, much of traditional psychology research explores cognition in a vac vacuum. Uh, it studies how people think when they're deprived of their smartphones and the internet. Um, and there's a lot of value in that kind of research. I do research like that myself for most of my studies. But for psychology to be able to make meaningful uh, inferences about how the mind works in naturalistic domains and how we can meaningfully inform policymakers and educators and society at large about what are the optimal ways of intervening on human behavior to help us, uh, we have to understand thinking and behaviors in the context where people engage in those behaviors, those real world decisions, which is in the context of extended cognition. We all have our tools with us all the time. Uh, smartphones are great in this regard. And so um, if we really wanna understand how people think in real world contexts, we can't just look at the vacuum of the lab. We have to also understand how people think when they're using tools to help them think, both what these tools are doing for them and also how it, their, the qualitative differences in how people think when they have access to tools versus when they don't. So this talk is meant as a call to action, especially to the graduate students in the audience who are looking for new areas of study that might be fruitful and important. Technology is advancing rapidly. It's changing how we make decisions, how we engage in behaviors, what we remember, what we think about, what we attend to, and we've barely scratched the surface in our understanding of how these tools are influencing us. So that is something that I think psychology is going to be moving towards in the near future, and I hope we are able to make tra uh, to, to you know make traction on these problems because otherwise we don't really understand how people are, and the mind are working. Um, I want to thank uh, several people. I've already uh, addressed Matt Fisher, who was uh, key to some of the uh, cognitive divisional labor studies. Uh, other people, Mar uh, Mary Hargis has been influential in this. Mac, uh, Mark Patterson has done some of those uh, analyses with me on creativity. My lab is a constant source of inspiration and uh, creative generation and also criticism to help me improve. Um, and then my parents, my wife, my daughter, who's you've got another picture of funding agencies, my colleagues, mentors, and all of the people who buy me ice cream, which is a necessity for me to be able to do good work. Um, and finally, I will open Q&A by ending with uh, gratuitous self-promotion. Uh, if any of you are interested in reading excellent books, um, well, and you're also open to reading mine, uh, I would uh, just wanted to make it make you aware of the fact that I have a comic book introduction to psychology. It's purely cartoons that explains the intuitions of psychology. If you or your students or family members or friends want to know, uh, want to have better ways of describing, not better necessarily, but maybe funnier uh, ways of describing the intuitions of psychology, or you want to let people know what it is that we do, that's a great introduction uh, that is not dense or technical and allows people to get that sense. And I also have a book on uh, the psychology of democracy, explaining how people make de political decisions, and the science of giving is a, a book on the, sci uh, the decision making that undergoes charitable giving. Um, so please feel free to pass those along and buy one for everyone you know. Um, but even if you don't, I'll leave that up there so it sort of primes you while I... Um, while I take Q&A. So thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope you've been paying attention. I can't actually see any of you um, in this virtual domain, but I, uh, I appreciate uh, whatever attention you've given me and I'm excited to have some discussion now.
Thank you so much, Danny. That was that was great. Uh, I learned I learned quite a bit. So we are um, able to do a couple of different ways for the Q and A. So I have all of our participants where I can see you. If you raise your hand by using the chat function, uh, I can allow you to talk and then ask the question yourself directly. Um, Otherwise, if you're interested in just typing your question in the Q&A, you can do that as well. Uh, either way works for me. So I, I just want to say, as I was reading through, number one, Jupiter, and number two, elephant, right? That's correct. <laughs> Am I right on those? And thank God you said the thing about, you know, the, the, the capital, because I was just going to correct you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I, I knew you I, would, yeah. <laughs> I did not know that at all. Um, okay, so I had a question since no one has late raised their hand, or at least I don't see it as of right now. Hold on. Uh, I have like multiple places where these things can go. Um, so my, my question is related to something that you have on your website. So you have that you have washable crayons in your shower. And again, because I did information foraging, I went on Google, I looked you up. Um, and so it kind of ties in many respects to um, the, the conversation that you were having about the creativity and the, the, the divergent thinking tasks that you were uh, comparing Google versus no Google. And so with, you know, places like Reddit and shower thoughts and all of that, do you think people are aware of the limiting kind of influence of uh, Google on their creativity? Do, do you think that they know that basically thinking outside the box requires thinking outside the search engine? Oh, that's a, oh, I, I, I need to write that down. Thinking outside the box requires thinking outside the search engine. What a great title for a paper. Um, <laughs> but so I'm going to make everybody wait while I write. Uh, uh, that's, that's great. Um, so I, my experience has been in most of the studies that I've run on metacognition and tech is that people are not very well calibrated to how tech is influencing their decisions. It's not, I mean, we, I showed you that they aren't aware of how tech is influencing their memories um, they uh, or their problem solving. Um, they know tech helps them. So like this goes back to the anagrams. You've got elephants, that's great. Um, I don't know if you got it before I gave the ELE hint, um, but we're gonna give, you know, I, I, it's, but like what happens is, is that people know that the hints are helping them, but they, underestimate how much the hints are helping them. And so they think, you know, well, I got 70%. Without the hints, I would get 50%. In reality, without the hints, they get 30%. So they just miss, they're miscalibrated in that. Um, in every place that I have looked, people underestimate the amount that tech helps them. And um, I uh, would not be then surprised to, it's, it's an interesting question then is, do, are they aware of how much tech can hurt them in other places? And um, it's a it's an interesting thing with this the, the the creativity studies because it doesn't tech helps them as an individual it helps them if you're using Google you will do as an individual better you will come up with more answers um, it's only at the level of the collective that we're seeing the problems and um, and I think that's really important because there's a commons dilemma here right there's a, a, a game theoretical situation which is I want to be as creative as I can be and the way to do that is to use uh, tools to help me. Um, but as a, as a group, we may be better off if my, you know, I want my lab to generate a lot of ideas. I may want them not to use Google because even though individually they won't do as well as collective, they'll do better. Um, so it's, it's especially difficult to realize in that case how much Google is influencing us because we have, um, we're not even seeing it at the individual level in the outcomes, right? Whereas at least with the anagram study, you can see that, well, I didn't know elephant, but now I've got it um, with a hint. Um, so it's a particularly pernicious thing. So most of the time, people aren't very well calibrated with how the how the help helps them and or hurts them, I guess. Um, and that's something that we as, a, uh, you know, as, as psychonomes need to start working on. Um, because we want to help people use the right tools, choose the tools that will be helpful for their goals. Um, I, Whenever I talk about this sort of thing, people always focus in on the, it hurts you in certain ways. Like people are worse. They are worse calibrated. They don't remember as much. All of these things that are true. Um, but it's not actually true that they're always worse. A lot of times they're just different. They're qualitatively different. Um, and so, you know, I may choose to go to a different vacation if I'm using Google to do research on vacations. Um, and maybe I would have gone to, you know, France if I hadn't used Google, but with Google, I'll, I'll go to, um, 
you know, Czech, Czech, Czechia or something like that. Um, that's not to say that Czechia or France is a better vacation. They're just different vacations. Um, but they may be better or worse for different goals. And so we want people to be able to choose the technology that will optimize their effectiveness at achieving their goals. Um, and there is very limited work right now on understanding what technology is optimal or helping people decide what is optimal, um, helping people make those decisions for themselves. So I've been working a lot on that. Um, and those are sort of, I have a class now, thinking in person versus thinking online, where I teach students how to choose optimal tech. Um, but it's not something that students do naturally. That sounds like an interesting like horizon for learning sciences and, and shaping the nature of classrooms. Yeah. Okay, so we have several questions in the Q&A. The first one, uh, how do you think we become better calibrated with technology and our own in, uh, own ability as individuals, especially since technology isn't going away? So kind of a follow-up to where you just where you just left. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, the way we get better is with practice and feedback. Um, and one of the interesting things about the use of technology is that our feedback is corrupted in some way. Like, you know, we get, um, when you use, when you try to solve these trivia questions, you have feedback on how well you did. But what you have is feedback with you using the technology. And what you don't have is a breakdown of how much the technology is helping and what you would have done otherwise. Um, so, you know, I, I showed some interventions, delays uh, before you use the technology is one good one. Um, and uh, having to ask for help is another good one. Those are both things that can give us that feedback and allow us to be better calibrated. In some very real sense, we would be better off if when we searched for something, it took seven seconds for it to come back instead of it coming back instantly. However, I find it hard to imagine that anybody, and this includes myself who just said it would be, I would be better off, would opt for a search engine that it was slower. Like it just, no, I want the information now. Um, and I find this with my friends. We'll be at the dinner table. Someone will say something. Someone gets curious and like, we're in the middle of a conversation and they just stop the conversation, pull out their phones and start looking up information because they need the information now. So I can't imagine that that's delay, that that tolerance of uncertainty is going to allow people to use most of the interventions that have been discovered so far. So there's a disconnect and we know it works, but that doesn't mean you can get people to use it. So that's, it's not really as helpful perhaps as an answer as the, the questioner might have wanted me to give, um, but it's it's that is where we stand in terms of the, where the literature is. Interesting. That that suggests that back in the old days of slow internet, there might have been some benefits to slow internet we didn't realize. Um, all right. So the next question, uh, Kelly Godert, uh, she says, um, one of the challenges to doing this work is that it is naturalistic in the way that the tasks are ones we do in our daily life. Yay for external validity. For folks who are very comfortable using standard lab paradigms, any suggestion on how to think about finding tasks or designing studies for those more naturalistic tasks? Or should I just ask my AI agent? <laughs> um, so um, this is a great question. And um, we are all more familiar and comfortable with just being in complete control of everything the subjects see. And I don't, I think one thing to think about is that we don't have to think of this as a binary choice. So we could say, okay, we're gonna go full external validity. People have access to Google and they can use anything they want. Um, and we'll see what they do naturalistically, in which case we don't have a lot of control over what they see, random assignment breaks down, we don't have causal inference, and that's a problem. On the other hand, we can go what we currently do, which is we they, they get exactly what we show them and they have, and we and it's a, only what we provided them. We can do things in the middle there. So one of the things uh, about the bots that we did in our bot study is that they are not, we did not use GPT or Gemini. Uh, I mean, we didn't use those because they didn't exist at the time of the study, but we wouldn't have used them anyway because we wouldn't have had control over their outputs. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can do partial access to the internet. You can give access to certain tools. You can limit what those tools are able to give them. Now, it's not perfectly externally valid because it's possible students won't be able to do the sorts of things they want to do. Um, and that like limits that. So then what you do is you say, okay, students tried to do X. We didn't let them do it. Now in future study, we should try to see what happens if we let them use X or if we control it. But we can still exert control over the specifics of the bots and what the bot answers are. Um, doing a lot of research with GPT right now um, and with good prompt engineering and access to the API, you can um, constrain what GPT is allowed to tell subjects. 
Um, and so you get them access to what is not real. It's not a pure form of generative AI, but it's a generative AI that will answer within constraints. And so you can then see what happens if you, um, you know, we could set different constraints and see how that affects the subject's response to different things and how well they learn it and etc. So you can um, get a sense of the different tasks people use generative AI for and what that does to their thinking. Um, so I think we're going to, I mean, generative AI, it's like a year old now. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane that it's affected us so much and it's only a year old, but, you know, give us five years of getting used to constraining it in different ways with API um, or just good prompt engineering. Uh, and with uh, other things we might want to do um, with tech and understanding it better. And we're going to be in a position to much better do that. The other thing, and this is, um, I think, going to be, a, you know, I was trained back when dinosaurs uh, ruled the earth. Uh, and, you know, we were taught, you know, you bring a subject into a lab, you control everything. With modern computer science techniques and econometric techniques and even things going on in psychology and field studies, we're getting better at, and better at doing studies where they are correlational to some sense and they're, they're quasi experimental, if you will, but we can exert statistical control on them. Um, and so one of the things I do when I use studies, I'm doing studies now in GPT, uh, we keep records of everything the subjects say, I and mean, then we have complete transcripts. And then what we can do is we can use, uh, you know, certain more modern um, linguistic analysis uh, to see how the way in which subjects use GPT affects the outputs. Um, and so if subjects ask a specific question in a specific way, um, how much, and that can be like, are they using adjectives when they ask the question or are they writing long versus short answers? We can evaluate it on many different dimensions. Um, and then we can see how that affects what GPT spits back, which we can also use data analytics to explore and how that affects behavior. Once we do that in a more naturalistic context, we're in a position where we can intervene on subjects and ask them to ask questions in a certain way or constrain GPT and what it responds and see how that affects things. So it's going to require multi-methods. It's going to require more uh, new methods and approaches. But I think um, we're, we're, we, we actually have a lot of tools, and especially if we're willing to recruit tools from our fellow behavioral sciences in economics, sociology, anthropology, which have had to deal with more real world environments. Um, they've got, they've, they've invented the wheel for a lot of these things. We can steal that stuff and make our science better. Before I change to a different question, I just, one of the questions was almost like a piggyback. So I want to make sure that since we're in this vein, Valerie Reyna says, great talk. Um, what do you think about the implications uh, for AI decision support? Uh, how should humans and AI combine most effectively? So you you kind of touched on that a little bit. Do you have anything more to say in that area? Oh God, that's uh, that's such a huge question. It's such a huge question, um, and um, yeah, it's uh, the answer is going to be it's a which one where it's very nuanced. Like if I were to give an answer to that, it's going to be wrong. Um, and it's not going to be wrong because I don't know the answer, which I don't, but it's going to be wrong because there isn't an answer because different decision supports are going to need to interact with people in different ways um, at different times in different contexts. And so the ultimate goal here is, is to be able to understand at a more nuanced level, like what are the contexts in which AI is more or less helpful? Do we care about environments that are friendly where AI is going to get the answer right most of the time? What do we do in environments where AI is not going to get the answer right? What is it? Do, do the stakes of a correct answer or an incorrect answer matter? Um, and, you know, uh, the trade-offs and the risks. Um, are there, there are some things that humans do a lot better than AI. So um, I'm going to give a shout out to Shlomi Sher, who may or may not be watching today, but he has uh, done a fabulous job of finding questions that AI is terrible at answering. Um, and so, um, he, he has this one example, uh, where he, uh, gives GPT, he says, John is a physics professor at MIT who is athletic and, uh, acrobatic and likes to go hunting on weekends for small rodents and birds. Is he more likely to be a human or a cat? And GPT will spit back. He's more likely to be a cat because even though he's a physics professor, which is more common for humans, uh, the fact that he hunts rodents and birds on the weekends and that he's athletic and acrobatic, those are features of cats. Um, and there's sort of like a fundamental misunderstanding there. Uh, 
And so these sorts of things suggest that there are places where humans are just fundamentally better than even the best AI. And there are some things like figuring out the, the square root of 2,496,312, where there's no way I would have a human even touch that. Like the only thing the human's doing there is putting it into the, into the computer and the computer will tell us what the answer is and we will accept that. So at the end of the day, I guess what we want to do is get people comfortable understanding when they should be recruiting which AI systems. And that is going to be, you can look at the work Frank Kyle is doing on how do we understand what other people know, and then at, uh, like expand that to how do we understand what AI can contribute. Um, and I don't think we have a good intuition yet, but I think that's something that will come up. And in the meantime, uh, you know, we can try to give people the gist of what's going on. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, Scott Steinmetz asked, or Steinmetz asked, uh, appreciate the clarity of your talk and point. Uh, you briefly mentioned that some skill development could be sidestepped on task A via tech, enabling more rapid skill development of downstream task B reliant on task A. This trade-off, lack of skill development in the basic skills so that you can get faster skill development on the advanced application seems pretty key. Do you have any citation recommendations for studies looking at that trade-off? No. Okay, that's not a very satisfying <laughs> answer. That was a um, simple response. I but like uh, so the, the thing is, is this is, so the work I'm doing, there's a lot of people who are doing the sort of thing I was talking about just today about how augmenting cognition affects people. And uh, as far as I know, I don't know any of the developmental literature on that. I'm not a developmental psychologist. This is stuff that I've started thinking about since I have a daughter and I'm watching her trying to outsource and thinking to myself, is, is letting her have this tool going to cripple her uh, abilities or is she going to now use... You know, now that she doesn't have to do addition to be able to get this answer, can she do future things? And so I guess the place I would suggest looking, maybe in developmental psychology, I just don't know enough developmental psychology to know. Um, but I think actually in the learning sciences, the phrase that um, the bottleneck concept phrase um, is one that comes to mind a lot in learning sciences, um, where there is something that is there that's preventing you from being able to do what's past it. And then you can, you know, and it's, it's, it's where you get stuck. Um, and sometimes being able to just skip that step allows people to do better beyond. Um, but I, I, I agree with the question that like, the, the, I, one of the things I wanted to do in this talk was phrase questions that I want psychologists to answer because they're important. And, and unfortunately, a lot of those questions are things that no one's working on, which is why our, if there are people working on them, please let me know, because I think they're fabulous questions and I'd like to know, but that I just, I don't see people working on, but I think need to be worked on. And so that is an example here, and I wish I could do better than just, nope, I don't have anything. But unfortunately, nope, I don't have anything. <laughs> Come back any year, and I'm sure the answer would be, you know, vastly different anyway. So, all right, uh, we have a couple of questions about the use of technology with respect to social relationships, uh, perspective taking, theory of mind, and the development and use of morality. Can you speak to uh, those types of domains uh, with regard to AI and augmented cognition? Well, that, that, uh, I wish you could narrow down that question a little bit for me, because that seems like, I guess it's nice. I can just talk about whatever I want and it fits. But um, can you, do you think you can so be a little- One of the more specifics, how do you think technology, particularly generative AI, impacts decision-making mm -hmm. or, again, theory of mind or social relationships? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I talked about this briefly in, when I was talking about what cues we attend to. Um, I think that social media has been exploiting our theory of mind quite effectively. Um, and that people understand the cue, people who are, there are people at social media companies who understand what psychologists understand about theory of mind. They understand the cues that we use to make social decisions. And then they ruthlessly exploit those to change the way we think about the world. Um, there is a lot of pluralistic ignorance out there and um, people want to know what other people are thinking to help guide their own thinking. And um, the algorithms will push certain things on you um, where it will suddenly seem like everyone in the world believes the same thing. When in reality, it's a half a dozen people who happen to be vocal and who happen and you've clicked on one of them. So the algorithms think you want to hear from people with the same perspective um, because you know, and, and then they shove that perspective into your face constantly. Um, 
people have evolved over you know, a long time the experiences of how various cultural norms affect social interactions and how we can interpret people's social behavior. And that happens at the evolutionary level of like, we understand that generally, but also cultures don't happen all at once. They slowly adapt and we learn along with those cultures. But right now we're facing a situation in which the culture or the social cues are changing overnight. You know, GPT comes out and it fundamentally changes things. One interesting thing, I, I saw a study, I can't unfortunately cite it off head, off my, at the top of my head, um, was looking at the number of people who use words like please and thank you with GPT. Uh, it feels so much like you're talking to a person sometimes that people treat it with the social norms of politeness and respect in a way that it doesn't it doesn't care. It's, it's an AI. It doesn't understand. I mean, it understands that you've used the word, but it doesn't change things. Um, and so... Like we are currently trying to uh, adapt social norms of understanding others to a world in which in many contexts, the way we interact with others makes those social norms no longer valid. Um, but this isn't the first time that this has happened uh, in history. There have been other time, you know, new technologies have come around in the past as well. And what we find is that people adapt and learn new social norms and the culture adapts with it. It just takes the culture a while to catch up. And in the meantime, you have times of real upheaval. Uh, GPT is gonna change things. I don't know exactly how yet, but it's gonna change things. And it'll be very interesting to see how society catches up. And I think that in the past, we really haven't had a psychological science to help advise people on how it can catch up. Um, but if we are fast enough off the draw and start doing these sorts of studies now, we'll be in a position to inform society and create interventions to allow society to adapt faster, faster and in healthier ways than has been done in the past. Um, but since GPT is a year old and like the studies, the day that GPT came out, some people started running studies. I was not that fast, but close behind. None of my research on GPT has hit the literature yet. It, that's the, the cycle and time of, like I was a month after GPT came out, I was running studies on it. Uh, none of that has yet made it into publication. So like the, the whole time cycle of the publication process and the research cycle means we still are a few years away from even seeing the preliminary data on what this is doing to us. Um, but I'm enthusiastic about the fact that people are excited about doing this. And so in two years, if you ask me this question, I'm going to have a lot more information for you, and we're going to be in a pretty good situation. Awesome. All right. Next question. Uh, do you believe that representations will universally converge towards collective search engines? For example, our representation of an apple might be unique now, but might be very similar across time if we all are used to searching via the same or similar search engines. Yes, I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm very concerned about that. that. That's sort of the creativity thing. The, the, the search engine gives us the same answers, which constrains the space of our thinking. If I ask a question. I was I was um, talking with some collaborators about this. You know, if I ask a question, list things that you can spread, and most people will say butter, jam, peanut butter. Uh, you know, if they're a little strange, they will say may mayonnaise or something. But <laughs> like, um, but what's interesting is you can also spread rumors. And you can also spread gossip and you can also spread disease. And those are very different ways of thinking about spreading things. So if you search on Google and say, what are things I can spread? And it pops up peanut butter, jam, mayonnaise, then you're going to start thinking of foods you can spread. And you're not going to be thinking about spreading disease or spreading rumors. Um, and the and that is where I think we are in we are a danger. We're, we're, we're better off if people interpret things differently. And the more we get used to seeing just the common answers, the, the less we're, the less we're going to think differently. If I Google a picture of an apple and Google always pops up the same picture of an apple to me, then that's going to be my prototypical apple. Um, and it's interesting because especially with ChatGPT and uh, similar, you know, uh, Dali and um, Crayon, Dali draws apples based on what people have drawn apples to be like in the past. It's got a database of human answers and then summarizes them. So we've already got things that people are, are generally prototypes. And then we increasingly prototype them more. Um, and it does constrain the representations people have. Um, and so 
you know, I don't know what the future will hold. Maybe with GPT, Google will lose its control of the market share. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I do know that the more different, if, you know, people are, some using your Gemini, some are using uh, GPT, some are using traditional search engines, some are talking to other people that will vary the inputs, which will vary the representations. And that is probably a good thing for our ability to solve problems. All right. So we've got a couple of questions about writing skills, spelling, grammar. So uh, Donnelly Spitner asks, uh, first, great talk. Thank you so much. Talking about goals, what are your thoughts on goals for online searching and how those mediate the effects of these tools uh, that these tools have on our cognition? Using Google to check the spelling or pronunciation of something is different from using it to check whether the answer you came up with yourself is correct. So searching for feedback. Mm -hmm. And it's different from looking something up to use it for the moment and not just needing to remember it later. Right. Do you think these goals, motivations affect the metacognitive monitoring and control or how it is affected by Google? Yeah, so I think it's, first of all, I love the way the question is framed and that it's associated with the goals that we have for the technology because the specific way we use the technology will, will and should depend on the goals and the way that the technology will affect us will and should depend on our goals. So I really like the way that was phrased. Um, that said, you know, there are times I look things up, but there's also this incidental learning thing. Um, so I, I'm, there are times where I look things up because I really need to know it. And then there are times that I look things up just because I'm writing an article and I need to have something like, you know, what is the capital of, uh, you know, is Bujumbura still the capital of Burundi? Um, but what's interesting about that is um, I can answer the question, is it still the answer? Uh, uh, and I can also tell you Gatega is actually the capital. And the reason that I can tell you that isn't because I was studying that Gatega was the capital. It's because it's incidental learning. It happened to be something I was, I mentioned, and it just stuck for some reason. Um, and so even in the context where we're searching for one thing, there is oftentimes in the real world, there's a lot of incidental learning and there are going to be, that's going to happen too um, with technology. So we're going to get uh, differences in that sense. Um, but there was um, something about you know, like using it for the different purposes you use it for, for grammar, for spelling, for looking up information, for solving it first and getting confirmation. I actually really like the confirmation, that, that latter one. And, and here's something. So I've been doing a lot of work recently, as I said, on GPT and how GPT affects education and how it affects learning. Um, because a lot of people are concerned that people will just spit an essay, you know, tell the prompt of an essay to GPT, spit that back to their faculty, and they won't learn anything. Um, and summarizing the work that has been done in my lab over the past seven or eight months on learning, I would say this. When you use GPT in lieu of your learning, you don't learn anything. So if you're using GPT to do the thinking for you, you learn very little. But when you use GPT to scaffold your own thinking, it's actually helpful and you learn more. And this goes back to that bottleneck concept thing. So if I'm trying to write an analysis of the economic situation in Africa, Using GPT to look up capitals or to look up information on specific countries in Africa um, or to look up key terms, you know, it's like, well, wh what actually is gross domestic product? I'm not confident. I can look up that and that will make my analysis when I do it myself much more nuanced than effective. And so I'll actually learn more if I use GPT to scaffold my thinking. But if I use it to replace my thinking, I learn less. And that seems to be sort of the um, takeaway message that's coming out of the work that I'm doing on GPT. Um, of course, the specific things that I learn depend critically on what I'm using GPT to scaffold me for, and they may or may not be aligned with the teacher's goals or the instructor's goals or my goals, depending on how I use GPT. Um, and this goes back to what I've been saying before, that I think that one of the big, I, I don't want to completely overhaul education on the basis of a new technology that's only been around for a year. But like, if I had to predict, I would say that within a few years, one of the key things we're going to be teaching students is to be um, deliberate in their use of technology, think about how they want to use it, and think about how to use it appropriately. So prompt engineering is going to become important. Uh, those sorts of skills are going to be taught explicitly, but also we're going to be teaching people to think through what is the appropriate technology for a given circumstance and situation. And that's going to become so central to the way we educate students, at especially the college level, um, that I do see a fundamental sort of shift in qualitative shift in what we're going to be doing. Um, but again, we've only had one year and who knows what is going to happen um, five years down the line. So that actually uh, relates really strongly to this other question. Given that 
we are outsourcing much of our uh, thinking daily, how would that affect the importance of or our reevaluation of what we used to see as basic skills for the future? For example, proficiency in writing versus proficiency in writing better prompts for chat B GPT, right? So like whether we are ourselves are better writers, we just know how to use ChatGPT more. GPT. Yeah. More. I mean, I honestly, it's an interesting question. That particular example, I thought a lot about, I use Shift F7 a lot when I use Microsoft Word. For those of you who don't use it, Shift F7 is the source function. And I will find myself, uh, I'm not going to try to find the longest word or anything like that, but I'll be like, there's a word that means what I want it to mean. And I can't think of it right now. That happens continually as I get older too. And then I'll Shift F7 it. And uh, then it usually pops up as one of the words. I'm like, that was the word I was thinking of. And I put it in. Um, but I started to notice that I was becoming dependent on it. That I wasn't, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying about the testing effect and retrieval induced forgetting and how being recalling something now affects my ability to recall it in the future. And by not using my own brain to think up the words I wanted, I was finding it harder to use my own brain to think up the words I wanted. And the way that manifested itself was in oral communication. Um, because in written communication, I didn't care. I had Shift F7. I could always use Shift F7. But when I'm talking to you right now, um, I can't shift F7 the words. I mean, I guess I could. I could be secretly typing things in shift F7. Oh, that's the word I want to use. But uh, it would certainly slow down my communication and sound and be very awkward looking. Um, and so in terms of how we write, writing is a different skill than speaking. And that in that sense, it can be, um, we may be, become worse at that with, that with the use of GPT. But to some degree, communication, effective communication is something that we're going to need to be able to do even when we don't have we can't outsource because we do communicate in ways that don't allow for outsourcing. Um, that said, uh, the bigger picture, the bigger context of your question, I think is right on. Um, I have lived in Pittsburgh now for almost six full years. And outside of the area that is like absolute closest to my, like my walk from my um, home to my office, I know that one. Um, I know where my favorite restaurants are. And beyond that, I have a very, very limited understanding of the geography of Pittsburgh. And the reason for that is that I use, G uh, I use um, GPS for everything. Um, and I am well aware that I am not learning Pittsburgh because it just tells me where to turn. So I don't have to construct a mental map. And while I could still construct a mental map, um, I I'm a cognitive miser. I mean, I, I don't. I'm usually talking to, you know, I'll talk to my wife instead. That's much more interesting than constructing a mental map. Or I'll be thinking about the talk that I'm giving or something like that. And it just tells me what to do. And I'm like, oh, I have no idea how far I've gone. I have no idea if this cur this street was curving. I have no idea what it looks like. All I know is that this is where I turn. And in theory, I could memorize routes and I have memorized some of them. But if there was a detour, I'd be in a lot of trouble of being able to find anything. Um, so, I mean, I think that there is this cognitive atrophy problem. Um, and I think that as new to, and in a way it doesn't matter as long as I have GPS, which I do anytime I have my phone, which is always, um, and as long as the satellite system is running, we're fine. It, the fact that, you know, we, be, I mean, I also am reliant on my glasses to see and no one ever worries like, oh my gosh, you know, wouldn't it be better to not wear glasses so you become better at interpreting blurry, blurry signals from the environment so that if you ever lost your glasses, you'd still be able to function. And no one really worries about that. Um, and, uh, you know, with GPT, we worry about it because it's new. Um, but to the extent that it's going to be available to us um, whenever we need it, it's not the worst thing to become a cyborg necessarily. I'm not going to argue it's a good thing to become a cyborg, but I'm not sure that the consequences are all negative. That said, I will warn everybody that GPT limits the number of questions you can ask in an hour. And so it is definitely possible when you're using GPT to suddenly not have access to GPT anymore. Um, this happened to me this past weekend. Um, and if I had become entirely reliant on it, I could have been in trouble. Um, there are also times when you have outages of various systems, and that also can make you, uh, can give cross problems. Um, where I found out recently when uh, I believe it was Facebook had a, a, an interruption of service and I suddenly had no way to contact certain people because of that's how I contacted them. Um, and so like, it's not the worst thing in the world to be able to function independently of these tools, but, um, and especially if, as long as GPT keeps limiting your query numbers, but um, we regularly, I mean, I use electricity all the time. I use a microwave instead of other forms of cooking. I use pre-made sauces from the grocery store instead of cooking them myself. If those disappeared, I would be in a lot of trouble. I'd end up eating plain noodles most of the time. Um, but um, 
but like that this is just how society evolves um it is interesting to question like thinking about how this is are there skills that are necessary or helpful for long-term things this goes back to the developmental question like if i don't master this skill now that may not be necessary if i have gpt to do it for me but it also may be a precursor to a skill that gpt can't help me with and that may be problematic um and that's another reason that we need to understand how we do and don't work with gpt and how these things work great response that reminds me of the at&t outage that led to some students saying that they couldn't find their way to class uh, without their GPS. <laughs> so there were several things on Twitter and X and whatnot where we all just had a, li a little laugh about that, but uh, same idea. Okay, Rhonda Mudry asks, uh, I thank you for your talk, this is wonderful. Just wondering if you have posited different ideas of influential factors for very uh, advanced learners or highly educated learners versus the typical learning adult group. So I agree with your intuition that more advanced learners will have different needs and will interact with technology in different ways and that the way that um, technology influences their cognition will be different than people who are novices to a task. In the same way that right now, advanced learner experts, we people study experts versus novice learners um, in domains because there's differences in how we represent things in the schematization, all of that. And I think that that will interact in interesting ways with, um, with technology. Um, the specific ways in which it does so will obviously depend on the nature of the technology um, and the nature of the expertise. And so it is hard to give an answer um, that is a general answer to the question. Um, so she does provide a little bit more context. Um, she uh, puts in that she comes from UConn as a med educator, but also a cognitive psychologist, uh, and that they are finding that learners pursuing advanced degrees who already have PhDs, master's, or bachelor's, even in medicine, uh, mm -hmm. struggle tremendously with reading text and note-taking. Mm -hmm. They're trying to pursue a grant to study how long to take to read uh, text from textbooks versus watch videos, and students tend to learn uh, or turn to YouTube or other video subscriptions as their preferred learning tool mm -hmm. because they cite information overload from scholarly text. However, your research is making me wonder if we should create manipulations for both kind of resources mm -hmm. in which we offer clarifications of the content, being the robot helper, for example, uh, and see what they do uh, with their metacognition. So that, that's the, yeah. the, the point from which she's coming. I mean, it, this isn't the first time I've heard the concern that attention spans are getting shorter, that people have lost the ability, that back before we had video before people had summarized things. You had to go to primary dense, uh, difficult texts and read them. And that's the only way to get the information. Um, and people have been concerned about the waning attention spans of this upcoming generation. People were concerned about the waning attention spans of my generation. And my, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I, you know, and I've been teaching intro psych longer than any of my undergrads have been alive. So like it's, it's uh, this has been a concern for a long time. Um, I think I'm going to say I haven't thought this through, and so I, this is a dangerous territory for me to be in. Um, but I think that teaching people to have good attention spans and be able to focus for longer is a general sort of cognitive, it's not even a skill per se, it's more of a cognitive ability that I think everyone benefits from. Um, it's like if I could increase your working memory. I mean, one way to increase working memory is to be able to write down things. So I can, you know, just writing down a grocery list increases my, like helps me in terms of my memory. But um, if I could actually have, instead of seven plus or minus two, I had a working memory of like 15, I could do a lot more complex calculations in my head and I would be able to, whatever it is that I want to do, I would do better. And I feel the same is probably true about attention that what, to the extent that I have s good attentional resources and the ability to um, apply it in the right way and for longer periods of time, Whatever it is I want to do, I will do better. And that includes interacting with tech. Um, so that's sort of more almost a basic level skill. Whereas something like knowing how to calculate a derivative feels less like a general cognitive skill and more like something that I'm okay plugging that into a, 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 system, a system like GPT and it giving me the answer, assuming GPT can do derivatives, which it may or may not be able to. Um, but like that seems like something that I don't need to know um, as long as I could look it up and learn it if I ever needed it. 
Now, there is a caveat to that, um, which I think everyone's probably already thinking of and I'm behind on, but is that um, learning how to do derivatives helps you understand the central way in which certain mathematical structures work. It helps you. And so if I was trying to do advanced math, um, if I didn't understand the logic of derivatives, I wouldn't be able to understand the logic of more advanced processes because it's a prerequisite. Um, and so again, this goes back to a previous question on what is the purpose of it? If I'm just looking up the capital because I want to check that I was right versus if I want to be using this as a scaffolding and foundation for future learning. Um, and then this goes back to what we were talking about with development of there are some things in math that actually are understanding at a deep and fundamental level are necessary to be able to go to the next step of understanding. And there are some things in math where you just memorize them because traditionally you had to know them in order to do things, but you could always just offload them and they don't affect your understanding so much as they affect and it's a basic addition. Like I know that six plus two equals eight. I need to do that in order to be able to do calculus. But at some level, if I didn't hadn't memorized that number, it wouldn't affect my ability to understand calculus. Um, and so I guess we can talk about numeracy versus memorization at that sort of level. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it certainly answers a question. <laughs> I agree. Um, okay, so uh, Paul Shoot asks, and I think this is an excellent question to like think think big with. Can you give a list of prioritized questions nobody is working on, but they should? Um, I hate you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that, that is, um, that is my dream question and my nightmare question all rolled into one. Um, the dream question is because it allows me to think big and my nightmare question, because it is such an impossible question to answer. I'm, I'm going to limit it obviously to, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously, I'm going to limit it to tech and cognition um, because uh, there are a lot of questions out there on like curing cancer and figuring out ocean uh, atmospheric or oceanic chemistry that I don't have in the slightest clue that though may be more important. But from our perspective and limiting it to that, um, you know, I, I think about the known unknowns question. You know, there are some things that we don't even know that we don't know. So we don't know to look for them. But um and there's also the level of analysis issue. See how I'm hedging left and right and I haven't even started? Uh, it's the level of analysis question, which is um, I could ask say, say something like, it's really important to understand how technology changes the way we think. That's the number one question. Um, and at some level, I think that's correct. Um, but at another level, you're like, yeah, but within that, there's a zillion other sub-questions that are, we have to prioritize. And I'm going to do two things here. Uh, the first of which is I'm going to thank you for the question because it's, I think, something I need to be thinking a lot about because we should be setting an agenda for that sort of thing. Uh, and that would make for a really good agenda setting exercise. Uh, and it's something that I would want to think deeply about. Um, but the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to skip that question. And the reason I'm going to skip that question goes back to my concern about uh, Googling and creativity. Um, because offloading doesn't just happen to devices and tech. It also happens to other people. Um, and if I come up here and I tell you these are the five most important questions in order, um, then uh, everyone who's listening to this will have taken that and that will constrain their thinking about what the questions are that we should be asking and the order in which we should be asking them. Um, and I am not arrogant enough to think that my current thinking on this is broad enough or correct enough that it should guide the field and constrain the way the questions that people are answering. I am thinking that for this talk, for many of the people in this talk, because it is psychonomics, it is such a broad group of people thinking that this is the first time they've thought about these specific issues. Um, and already I'm going to be pushing you in certain directions versus not by the way, I, by having talked about metacognition so prominently and not talked about things like plasticity as much. Um, but at the same time, this is an area that's new, it's important, and there are going to be lots of sub areas that people will come up with that are going to move it forward. And I would prefer the hive mind to be solving that question than be the one pushing it myself uh, in certain directions. So I appreciate the question. Um, and I know this sounds like a lot of hand-waving and dodging, but I actually think that we as a field will be better off if people are thinking more independently about the question. 
All right. Or you could just find Paul at the upcoming Psychonomics in New York City and you guys could, you know, share a drink and have some hive minding of your own. By the time November comes around, I'll have spent a lot more time thinking about this question and I'll have, probably have a better answer than this one. Nice. All right. Uh, another question. Automated psych uh, psychometrics technologies like Big Five that tell us the valence of emotions experienced by people and their personality, uh, say, in an office meeting. What kinds of traps does this pose in terms of developing understanding and empathy empathy we have for our colleagues? I mean, anytime, uh, there are two, two um, a number of traps. One of this is that uh, if we start offloading understanding other people and their emotions to technology, um, that's going to atrophy our own abilities to do it. And anytime we don't have that technology or the nuances are something that the technology can't handle, we won't be as equipped for it. Um, that isn't to say we can't use it to improve or um, supplement what we do, but I would be nervous about offloading entirely to it. The second thing is, is it relies on our current understanding of how emotion works and how um, people, personality works. And, um, you know, if there's anything we've learned from the history of science, it's that at every generation, people think they're the ones who have solved it and everyone before them was an idiot. Uh, maybe not an idiot, like, wow, how clever of them to have come up with the fact that like the... Uh, four elements are what drives things or how clever for them to think that bile phlegm and blood are what drives illness and it's a you know um we may think that but we also think they were wrong and they were really wrong and wow how how wrong is it and aren't we glad that we live in a society where we understand medicine and then it's like well but every generation has said that about the generation before we get better understanding of medicine we get better understanding of psychology we get a better understanding of how science works and we look back and we say they were wrong well it would be foolish for us to think <laughs> to not look at that historical example and not realize what we think right now is wrong. It's better and closer to, to right than previous generations, hopefully, but it's still wrong. And 50 years from now, they're going to look back on modern personality psychology and modern emotion psychology and think how primitive. If only they knew what we don't know now. Um, and if we start offloading to AI our current understanding, there's a risk that we won't get better understanding. Um, there's a risk that we'll lock ourselves into this. Um, and there's also the risk of the self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, a lot of times in behavioral sciences, um, I think about certain examples in economics most prevalently, but uh, people will put out a model of this is how people behave, which isn't how people behave. It's how people should behave. But it is, um, you know, they put out a model of how people behave. And then um, as a result, people read that and they're saying, oh, that's how we should behave. And that leads them to behave that way. And the theory itself is what drives the behavior rather than the behavior driving the theory. Um, and Barry Schwartz um, has a lot of really interesting work on this. So he published an article in Behavioral Science on this notion of how science, uh, behavioral science itself can constrain behaviors rather than describing behaviors. Um, and so one of the constraints is that if we start putting these behavioral scientific things into technology and losing those technologies to then define our theorizing, that we get stuck in those traps. So those are some traps that come to mind right away. My guess is there are many others. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't use them because they're, you know, costs, of course, but they're also benefits. But we should be aware of what the costs are. Or, and, as, and thinking through these things is a really useful enterprise. All right. Second to last question. Thank you for your great talk. My question pertains to the first experiments on trivia that you discussed. Were there any participant variables that moderated the prediction estimates made by participants? Yeah, so um, I did not go, so there's a paper by Matt Fisher and I that goes through and describes all of this data. And uh, I did not even try, I didn't, I talked about, I think three studies and there are many more studies in that sequence that control over various confounds and look at various participant information. And so that was just to give you the in, in, intuitions, not to give you the full depth and, and deepness of it. I mean, we get the common, common overconfidence variables, right? Uh, men tend to be more overconfident than women, for example. Um, that didn't interact with the use of tech, which was interesting. There's just a main effect there. Um, we don't, to my recollection, um, and I don't want to be overconfident about this, but to my recollection, we didn't find much that interacted on a personality or individual differences level with tech. But we did find all of your ex overconfidence. There's a large literature looking at individual differences of who's overconfidence, and all of those things were present in our data. Uh, they just weren't interacting. They were working as main effects. Thank you. All right. And then this is fascinating, and I appreciate you giving this talk today. You discussed at the beginning of the talk about differences in what we attend to when using search engines like Google. 
I'm curious as to whether you think that we will end up seeing new attentional theories, perhaps theories that are for non-tech environments and others that describe tech environments. And to follow up, do you think that they will influence one another to create new theories of attention? Yeah, I hope so. Um, look, there are going to be times where the tech doesn't qualitatively influence our cognition. And those are important um, because those are things that are seemingly cognitive universals per se. Let's just, let's just, you know, like there's going to be some things that are, the tech does not seemingly influence. And those are important things to know. Um, and there are going to be some things that we do in the absence of tech that is really important to know too, because that's our naturalistic state, if you will. Uh, and then different tech is going to influence things in different ways. And we may end up having many theories, um, which is sort of like a theory of how we use attention while using Google, a theory of how we use attention while using GPT, a theory of how we use attention when we use technology X, um, which all describe what's happening internally that is different when we have when we're using that tool than when we're not using that tool. And my hope, and I think this is not a like tomorrow project, I think this is like a decades down the line project, but my I hope that we will eventually have an Uber theory, which is here are the characteristics of a technology that influence the nature of the attention, the, our attentional capacity, or our attentional process. Um, and you can almost call it a, like a hierarchy. When you are in this situation and the tech has this features, it drives you in this way so that we can then predict future techs, how they will affect our current, uh, how they affect attention and other forms of cognitive processing. Um, and uh, and so that's the sort of, the, the high level thing has to come. And that theory can't come until we've got low level theories looking at how individual technologies are affecting individual types of cognition. Um, but at some point, I would love to see psychology put it all together in sort of the, the theory of uh, augmented cognition or external cognition or even cyborg cognition. I feel like one of these days that, you know, we can have a journal of cyborg cognition, which understands that humans and machines are integrally linked, maybe not biologically yet, maybe we haven't implanted them, but still we're using them to the point where some of our thinking is happening, not in the brain, but in, a, in, a, in the tech. And so we are at this point already cyborgs. Um, and then thinking about cyborg cognition as distinct from human cognition, um, and what is the theory of how cyborg cognition works? That is, you know, a long-term goal. I don't want I, going back to the prioritization question. If it, if in twenty years we have some really good theories of that, I think psychology will have made big progress. Um, and I think these are important and exciting questions because it's really, you know, sometimes you look at what goes on in psychology and you're like, everybody is doing slight parameter tweaks on existing theory. Um, and here is a place where there is room and space for massive expanse, uh, expansion of theory, like massive changes and, and qualitative changes in what we are thinking of how we do it. Um, and so it's a, it's a really exciting space, I think, and a really exciting time to be exploring these questions. All right. So in the interest of time, because I know this is supposed to end it, you know, on the end at the hour, but lots of people put, put their things back to back. So I thought I might ask a culminating question of you. Okay. I know you don't want to constrain our thinking and have, you know, some sort of sound bite that overrides all of the, you know, elaborate answers that you've given to this point. But if you were to maybe put some sort of closing idea mm -hmm. that we can all walk away with, yeah. would that be? Buy my book. No, no, I <laughs> just kidding. Um, although you should do that too. Um, yeah, just put those put those pictures back up. And yeah, put those pictures back up, right? No, um, but more seriously, I would say um, the take home message here is that it goes back to where I started. Thinking happens in the brain. Thinking happens in the individual, but it doesn't only happen there. And we are. And I think this is a good thing about humans is that we do use tools and technologies and other people and our environments to enrich our thinking. And because of that, our theories uh, and observations about how thinking happens should include our tools and environments and other people and such that enriches our thinking. Um, and that does provide methodological challenges. Kelly Godert mentioned, you know, what do we do to do this in the labs? Creates methodological challenges for us. It creates theoretical challenges for us. Um, but, you know, the point of our science is to understand human thinking and behavior. And um, if all we can do is understand thinking and behavior in the absence of the context, people, I mean, context, social and uh, non-social and, you 
um, and our tools, which are so such an essential part of the human condition, um, then we haven't done a very good job. So um, exploring sort of the extended cognition domain should be uh, a pretty important area that should not be neglected as we move forward as uh, cognitive sci scientists um, and, uh, and understanding, you know, and for people who do more specialized work on, you know, like learning sciences, you know, if we only look at how people learn when they don't have access to their tools, well, we, that's not going to effectively describe what people are doing in classrooms. And for policy sciences, you know, if we're only understanding how interventions work outside of the context of our tools, then that's not going to intervene effectively in the real world. So we need to start paying attention to that more. And there's a lot of, um, I think, exp exciting future uh, exploration to be done. Lovely. Great, thank you so much. Um, as a reminder uh, that I kind of stumbled through at the beginning of the introduction, uh, Danny's talk is one of a series of talks that we have available. So go to your nearest Google, Bing, Yahoo, uh, DuckDuckGo, and just type in One World Cognitive Psychology Psychonomics, and you'll see the list of those recordings uh, dating back to the beginning of this series. Uh, also, there are uh, talks coming up in April and May. Please make sure to check that out and register uh, as is appropriate. Thank you again, Danny. So phenomenal to hear you talk. Lots of, again, big ideas. Um, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Awesome. Congratulations, everybody. Bye-bye.